Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. I know you want to choose between NoSQL and SQL. Now you don't have to choose. We got a solution that's perfect for this. ToroDB. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. F-L-Y dot com. Hi, everybody. It's time for our annual audience survey. We'd really like to hear from you. It helps us understand our audience better, know what you like and don't like, how you listen to the show. It also helps us tell advertisers what kind of people listen. But I promise you, your feedback is always kept personally anonymous. All you have to do is visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It'll just take a few minutes and it'll help us make Twit even better. We really appreciate your support. And any help you can give us, twit.tv slash survey. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 377, recorded March 1st, 2016. Toro DB. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payment from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash floss. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section to get your $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects you might be using every day, the little projects you might not might might be using every day as well. There we go. I'll just mess up the whole opening here. It's great. Uh, and projects that you may want to download right after the show and go play with it. I bet today is going to be one of those. Uh, joining me today is Aaron Newcomb. Aaron, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Good to see you. Cool, yeah, yeah. It's been so long. You don't write, you don't call. I don't, I don't know what's going on in your life. But <laughs> and thank you for stepping up at the last minute to uh, co-host this show because I think you'll be pretty excited about this once we get going. Of course, I do want to point out that I am in Santa Monica at ZipRecruiter. They're providing me the office space so I can do this show. And also, uh, it's kind of sunny back there, so you might not see some bright sun like we do every once in a while, but I'm in the room that often has clouds in the background. Wait, no, we do have some clouds. And you're in your usual lair, I presume? That's right. I'm in my lair, my secret lair. I've got all my projects. I've got LEDs, you know, coming off spools of things and all Ooh. kinds of adapters and cables and making all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I'm just here uh, doing what I do. Oh, also, I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware that this show is off the hook. <laughs> you finally got the phone away. Good. That's right. <laughs> no. So the phone, I've taken the phone off the hook. It, it never rings except when I'm doing this show. So I've taken the phone off the hook. I can't promise that there won't be any deliveries. My dog will go crazy, but at least the phone won't ring. So that's good. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, uh, Aaron, I understand you know a little bit about databases. Yeah, I do. Actually, I, uh, the big part of my day job actually is uh, working a lot with Oracle Database. So cool. that's what I'm. That's what I'm tasked to do at, at my job. So, uh, so I know a lot about relational databases. Know a little bit about NoSQL databases because we have to live in that world as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is an exciting topic for me this morning. And have you ever seen that wonderful animated video about five minutes long called MongoDB is web scale? I've heard about it. I have not seen it. Oh. Uh, we're going to have to go look at it, uh, maybe not right now, but after the no, show. No, right? not right now. It's, it's not safe for work, some of the language for the end, or we'd actually even play a snippet of it here. But the thing about this video is that it's a guy who's giving a talk about a relational database, and uh, he's talking to a fanboy of MongoDB. And as they start saying, well, the way, you, the way you MongoDB people get the numbers that you're getting is because you turn off all the important features to protect your data. And he even gets sidetracked by saying, you know, if you don't care about your data, you might as well write it to DevNull. And the, the fanboy says, does DevNull shard? It's hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. So anyway, uh, we're actually going to disprove that video today because what we have on today is ToroDB uh, by the creator Alvaro Hernandez. And uh, I saw this at scale two months ago. And to explain it very simply, uh, the, the wire protocol of MongoDB uh, is provided through a Java interface to talk to Postgres at the back end. Now, you would think 
there's no way this is going to be fast or efficient because you're going from one entire style of doing things to another entire style of doing things, traditional relational databases. But here's the advantage. Postgres has been around for a long, long time and it can both horizontally and vertically scale and, uh, and it's very fast, extremely fast. Uh, MongoDB hasn't been around as, as long. And so when they get fast uh, uh, benchmarks in Mongo, it's because they're turning off everything that makes it reliable. So they can just simply write the data and hope it comes back. Uh, but uh, what Alvaro has managed to do is write this wire protocol MongoDB server, essentially, in Java, and that goes directly to Postgres. And so you can drop it in and place your existing MongoDB, and it's faster. That's the paradox. i got to figure out how he did this. So uh, uh, what does that sound like to you, Aaron? It sounds great. I mean, this is kind of like uh, uh, the Holy Grail or something, right? For, for Because there's always this competition between the two. Which one do you use? When do you use it? Um, mm -hmm. And even in even in the world of big data and things, people are trying to get at their data, which live in these relational databases and pull them in or transfer data back and forth. So I'm excited to see if that makes this possible as well. Yeah, well, I hope I didn't give away all of Alvaro's talk. I've just got a lot more to talk about. But uh, before we bring him on, I have a very important message. Because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Braintree. By next year, maybe even next week, there could be a whole new way to pay. Maybe it'll be next Bitcoin or the next Apple Pay or maybe even both. Fortunately, Braintree's full-stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds. So you can adapt easily, too. Leo spoke with Harper Reed about how Braintree powers the brand new PayPal commerce tool and why it is so important to do when it comes to the contextual commerce. You know, as a developer, we built a lot of these tools to be easy to use for developers. So thinking about APIs, really, it's just about building blocks. So if you look at, you know, huge companies like Facebook and Uber, they're able to use these building blocks to do really neat integrations for their transportation services. But at the same time, the small business developer is able to use these to bring retail customers, their own businesses into this contextual commerce world. Accept everything from Pounds to PayPal in the next big innovation from any device with just one integration. And when that new payment method comes out, all you'll have to do is update a few lines of code. No late nights, no complicated recoding, no stress about staying ahead of the curve. Braintree Payments is here to help. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash floss. We thank Braintree for their sponsorship of the show. And now let's go ahead and bring on Alvaro. Alvaro Hernandez, welcome to the show. Where are you speaking to us from? From Madrid, Spain. And so it's uh, like early evening there, right? It's, yeah, it's starting the evening, but as you can see from the outside, still light outside. It's, you know, the weird time zone we're in Spain. Okay, yes, yes, definitely. Um, so uh, give us the 30,000 foot view. What problem is ToroDB trying to solve? So basically is that there's currently a choice they have to make either between a SQL relational databases with the durability warranties, the, the reliability that they have, or a new SQL database where you can scale better and or, or short horizontally scale, but there's no, no both of them at once. So, so what if I want to scale, I want to be big, big, big data, but at the same time, I want to keep up with the durability, the reliability, and of course, all the functionality that SQL databases have. So this is what ToraDB achieves. It's, it's best of both worlds. It's a database that is both, both a SQL and a NoSQL database. And the way it does that is the layering a NoSQL compatibility layer on top of a relational database that is well known and trusted by, I would say, almost everybody, which is PostgreSQL. Now, one of the things I, would, like I said in the opening, it's, it's, like, it's like I would think that this kind of translation would make it slower. But what have you found in practice with this? Well, it is surprisingly fast. And, and it's not even that we wrote good code, which I hope it is anyway. It's, it's because Postgres is also damn fast on, underneath. I mean, it's, it's been a lot, uh, here for, for quite a long time. And in general terms, relational databases have been here for 40 years. So really, uh, I mean, it takes a lot of time for a database to mature. And Postgres and relational databases have already had a long time for doing this. They are often referred as legacy. However, I see that's a completely wrong perception. I mean, they are really good at their work. It, it's just that they need to be adjusted to do different kind of workload, workloads if, if that's what you want, like in the NoSQL world, but they're pretty good at what they do. That's also true what you said at the beginning, that most NoSQL benchmarks, especially MongoDB benchmarks, if you really look at them, you see that most of the time uh, they are done, these benchmarks are performed with most of the durability warranties turned off. If you suddenly turn them on, 
like basically you do uh, acknowledge of the rights, like right, or you do journaling, and you also enable replication, which is something that you should probably want to do on a MongoDB installation. Then performance drops by more than an order of magnitude. So it's not that fast. Now TorDB has two uh, sides of this performance. One is more on the OLTP side, where we can use uh, PostgreSQL, which is, a, again, it's, it's a fast database, especially the last version. 9.5 is really fast. We have seen a significant improvement in, in speed. And, and then we're also working on a version right now that it's working, running on, on Greenplum. This, uh, it, it's another uh, database which has also been open source recently, and Greenplum is specialized on more on OLAP and data warehousing workloads. And there you can also shard horizontally uh, across many servers, they're called segments. So to mm -hmm. be running on, on it, it's also very fast because Greenplum is also very fast on this kind of workloads. So it's just a conveniency uh, that we're using very fast databases underneath TorDB. Okay, and so I, 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 I know one way you could get this kind of like, well, let's, let's back up a step because some people maybe not know what MongoDB is. We did a show on them quite a while back, but um, what am I looking at from my client to MongoDB, what does that look like? Is, is, it, is it JSON documents or something else? Yeah, so the, the MongoDB interface is, is JSON documents. Internally, it uses something else called BSON, but that's transparent for the user. You just use JSON. And, and if you're doing some programming with the MongoDB API, well, that's, that's the API you use. But if you use like the console, it's just uh, JSON documents and you can even use uh, JavaScript to like create a for loop and insert like a bunch of documents or so. So it's just all JSON, JSON document style. It's a document database. Would I typically talk to this directly with Ajax or do I need something in between on, on my side? Well, you require a driver anyway. So hmm. uh, there are some HTTP uh, REST interfaces for MongoDB, uh, but most likely you're going to be using a, a driver, it could be a Java driver, an OGS driver or whatever. Uh, because in internally, like the wire protocol, the, the protocol that MongoDB uses to communicate client to server, it's a binary wire protocol that is not HTTP. Now, I understand you're actually just using the standard um, MongoDB drivers with this. So the protocol, is that compatible with standard MongoDB? Yeah, indeed. So we part of the work that we did for MongoDB, uh, for TorDB, sorry, it's, it's this uh, layer that we call MongoWP, Mongo Wire Protocol. And this is a layer written in Java 2 that translates and understands the wire protocol exactly the same way that MongoDB does. There's, there's no difference. So uh, TorDB with this layer on top behaves as a pure MongoDB server. Indeed, this layer uh, it is also available as a separate open source project. So maybe if anyone who's listening here can want to write like a MongoDB server, they can use this, this layer, this tool MongoWP, and build their own MongoDB compatible servers. This is again, separate project, but also open source. And supports MongoDB protocol as is. Uh, and you know, it also, all the compatibility remains on your side and implementing all the commands. But the translation of those commands to and from the binary format that goes over the wire, that's already done in, in this layer, Mongo wire protocol. Well, now, okay, so, so if what we're looking for is, uh, this is a green start, I'm, I'm building a new project, I'm not already using MongoDB, why don't I just use Postgres's uh, JSON data formats that have been introduced in the last couple of versions? All right, that's a really good question. Uh, and a lot of people came to this site, like, uh, why don't we uh, can just simply use Postgres? Well, the, one of the main reasons is that Postgres, despite of the great JSON uh, work that has been done with JSONB, which is, uh, again, simply amazing, and a lot of the people behind it, because I'm very uh, close to the Postgres community, and it's a really great work. Now, it's probably not enough to accomplish the goals that NoSQL wanted to accomplish. There are basically two goals that NoSQL want to accomplish. The first one is agility, uh, and JSONB provides this. The other one is a scale, like, like in the video, like MongoDB is scale, right? Mm -hmm. and so, and, and this scaling is, is not that simple. It's not that easily achieved within Postgres. Now, in contrast, the MongoDB replication protocol, which even though it's not a perfect protocol and has its own flaws, can more or less scale well up to a certain point. So, uh, like if you compare Postgres, cannot scale that same way. And scaling Postgres is definitely a non-trivial task. So, uh, it cannot basically fulfill the second goal uh, of it. 
Uh, whereas ThorDB, uh, we use uh, the MongoDB replication protocol, and, and thus we can scale the same way as MongoDB can scale. Uh, then, if you if you had a previous uh, MongoDB installation cluster or or just uh, software written against the MongoDB API, then uh, you would have a hard time translating that to uh, Postgres itself, uh, because the JSON language, uh, I mean the API, is completely different. Now, with ThorDB again, you get you would get 100% compatibility. You can even replicate from a current MongoDB cluster. And last but not least. The way we get the information into the relational database from MongoDB, from the MongoDB users, is not just direct translation. We don't even use JSONB except for very tiny stuffs. We perform a document to relational transformation. So documents are split into pieces, and these pieces are basically right into the tables in a pure relational way. And this has several advantages. Uh, that are related to speed of searches, to the amount of I.O. that you require to store the information, to the space required, the compression you can apply, and all this will not be available to be achieved with pure JSONB in Postgres, which again, it's great adva uh, advance of Postgres, uh, but it's probably not enough for most NoSQL users. Why in the world did you want to do this? <laughs> I mean, how did, how did you actually get on this path of of trying to make this uh, uh, Reese's peanut butter cup that is uh, Toro DB. Yeah, well, it all started uh, as a as a research project. We're uh, the company behind Toro DB is an R and D company in in the database space, and we kind of research and crazy stuff. Like uh, we did previously um, uh, a project that also helped helped shape ThorDB, which is a project we, which we call the Billion Tables project. And it was a project to create a billion tables inside a database, in, inside Postgres, and it worked very well. So at, this, at some point we were guessing like, well, how would you map uh, a JSON document or JSON uh, document in general into a relational database? So we were kind of researching on this space, and we came up with a way of basic layering the bits on, on the relational tables in a very interesting manner. And, and it may lead to a, a significant number of tables using uh, is at some point, but we knew through this project that we did before, the Billion Tables project, that that's not a problem for Postgres. So we started thinking like, hey, I mean, this is really cool. Why don't we just take this and, and make it available because it looks like there's a very convenient way of representing a document or a hierarchical structure of keys and values in a relational way that is very convenient. And this could provide like both, a, a, again, a NoSQL interface and then a SQL interface. And you could have both at the same time in the same piece of software. So that was basically the motivation. I think this is fantastic, and it's a really interesting way to use both. Um, and I've got a couple of technical questions uh, in a minute, but there's a question from the chat room that we want to get to from the Andromedan. Uh, he says, could you do the same thing for non-Postgres uh, database servers? So things like uh, uh, MS SQL or MySQL or Oracle DB. Um, could, could you have cho chosen either of them? Uh, I'm guessing this implementation is specific to Postgres, but could it be done? Yeah, so uh, the way we have we have written the software, uh, we we are very in, in our company we are very aggressive with modularity and abstraction. So we have built like several abstraction layers in in, in this software in TorDB. One of them is the database. Now, of course, software is far from perfect. Ours is also far from perfect, and the way we have done it is it's a little bit now tied to Postgres itself. So it's a little bit Postgres centric. Now it's still separated into layers. And uh, along the past month, we've been doing a significant effort in terms of backtracking a little bit these layers into an API that is cleaner and less dependent on Postgres. That work is almost done by now. And that's why we're, we're quickly trying to add a new backend, which is now Greenplum, uh, this uh, analytics and, and data warehousing optimized database. This is not terribly fair because Greenplum itself is derived from Postgres. So there's still a lot of similarities. Now, uh, in the future, yes, the answer is pure yes. We really want to support different backends, new backends, uh, other databases. I cannot uh, say right now which is the roadmap, uh, basically because it's not finished yet in terms of new databases, but we really want to support different databases. And um, some of those that you have already mentioned, they are on our list. 
Anyway, uh, this is open source. Uh, it's published on GitHub, so we really accept issues on, and, of course, pull requests. So anyone is, is free to, to go into the source code and add a new backend. It is definitely not a non-trivial task, but will be very welcome here. Yeah, no, that's great. I, that's always the right answer, I think, when you're dealing with an open source project. It's like, hey, <laughs> you know, this thing's open. If you wanted to get it to work with something else, go for it. Uh, we would welcome any contributions. So that's right. great. You mentioned um, that the roadmap isn't quite complete yet. What is the status of Toro DB? Is this a is this a one Is this a GA product, or is it still um, uh, in beta, so to speak? Okay, so I would say it's a little bit alpha. Um, we're still in development stage, so we are now approaching what we call version uh, 0.4 and 0.4, and uh, won't take as long to get to 1.0. So 1.0 GA is going to be released in this year, 2016. Um, there are still some bits to be done, uh, but uh, we have done a significant amount of work. It's definitely usable right now. Uh, it's, it's, I would say, it's very stable. Uh, we're now work, working on, on basically making things easier for users. It was previously like a product for developers. Now we are uh, writing documentation, we are packaging for standard uh, Linux uh, distributions, and we're working on, on making it more user-friendly, like configuration files and so on. Uh, we still need to add some features to make it GA, but I would say it's definitely ready for wide testing. Anyone is really welcome to test it, to use it. Even in production, just no warranties provided yet. And uh, again, get, at, get in touch with us, uh, report us any issues that you may find. Use GitHub, use it extensively. Um, so, you know, we are very well welcoming any kind of feedback and, and uh, reports from users. Uh, that's, that's basically where we are at right now. That's fantastic. Do you have any companies or uh, people that you've been working with that are really interested in this uh, that have been helping you out? Yes, indeed. I mean, we're working with, with some companies uh, of, of different sizes and sectors where they are very interested. Um, there's, there's like people who are uh, wanting to use TorDB for, for doing one thing, which is kind of more or less unavailable right now to NoSQL people, which is analytics. If you take NoSQL, like for instance, MongoDB, uh, and you try to do like analytics, they, they work not very efficiently. They're kind of slow. Uh, I would say something else, but it's not reply. I mean, uh, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> even though they, most people think that NoSQL was designed for big data, but the reality is that they, they scale more or less well in more or less an OLTP scenario. But when you switch into data analytics, data warehousing, uh, they are, they're not designed for that, those kind of workloads, and they're usually very slow. Uh, so uh, we have faced some, some customers um, where there's, there's one in Spain right now that they were struggling with, with MongoDB in this case. They were doing some aggregate queries over a, a decently sized uh, data set. I'm talking about terabytes. And it was painfully slow for them. And we, we are working with them because, you know, when we pair, in this case, like TorDB with, with Greenplum, uh, we are we're getting like uh, orders of magnitude speed up uh, because this is really optimized for this kind of workloads. So uh, in this case, what we're doing is an architecture where uh, Mongo, a TorDB connects to a MongoDB cluster as a replica. Uh, it is not disturbing the cluster, which is usually used for OLTP, replicates all the information into TorDB on Greenplum, and then you can run the queries on Greenplum, and you use pure SQL for those queries. And all the kind of customers that we're already helping is customers that want to offer, uh, they have like a relational database already, it's already in place, and they have their support contracts, their maintenance, their experts in SQL, their security, their backup scripts, like a lot of infrastructure that you have to build when you have a database. And they don't want to uh, introduce a new stack, like, like a new NoSQL database that will require, again, new servers, new certifications, new support contracts, and network policies and security and all of that stuff. But their developers want to have uh, NoSQL interfaces because they like that, because the API, uh, the agility, that, that's nice to have too. So they want to have like both things in the same place, and that's what also TorDB is helping them to do. Because in, in the same database, if you want to, or in different databases within the same node, you can have both a SQL database and a NoSQL database with a common uh, NoSQL API, and you can even, if you're on the same database, you can even join that information. 
if you want to. So you can do perform a join from a SQL table and a NoSQL generated table. So that's pretty cool. Well, let's go into that a little bit more. I would presume that since you're not actually using JSONB on the Postgres side, you must be tearing these down. And are you creating individual tables for parts of the JSON that's coming in? How does that work? Yeah, uh, that's exactly the case. Uh, I mean, we are using JSONB, but just for tiny stuff, which is not related to document data. So we're using a little bit of JSONB. And uh, so, uh, but other than that, the, the data is split into pieces, and these pieces go to different tables in a relational way. Uh, let's think about this in a very uh, probably simple manner. If you insert a document with a key called name and a key called surname, and, and you insert like, like a million records, like a million documents, if you really think about it, all those million records will have the same structure. There's always a name, there's always a surname. And if you really think about that in, in a typical NoSQL case, you're storing the whole thing all the time, like all the time, like name, blah, surname, blah. You're storing that all the time. So if you, if you really think about it, this is a lot of repetition of non-information. That name and surname, the keys, are meta-information. You're repeating that meta-information all the time. That's a waste of space. That's a waste of memory. That's a waste of cache. Of course, document can change. But then you add a new key like age or the uh, new key like address. But then a lot of records, maybe thousands of records, or, or hundreds of thousands will also have that address or that age or both or, you know. So if you really think about large collections, they repeat a lot of meta information, a lot of a structure all the time. What we do in TorDB is capture this structure. We perform an analysis on the document and say, oh, this document looks like this. So it's of this structure. So we store this structure in, in a place. That's the only point where we use JSONB to so generate tiny documents which uh, resemble this structure without any data. And then we have pointers to the real data. And data, depending on the level of the hierarchy in which it is, it will definitely go to different tables in, in, in the relational way. If there's new keys with different shapes of documents, new tables will be created. So they will go to different places in the database. And, and then it's stored to be handles all this transparently. So you don't have to define a schema beforehand. You don't need to say, hey, this data is going to come in and has this shape. You don't have to do anything. Stored to be will create tables if necessary and will pull together all the information back to you as a single document when you ask for documents or you ask for parts of documents without you having to notice the internal structure whatsoever. Well, it probably means that if I look at the actual schema that ToroDB is managing, I, I'm, I'm not going to see any patterns in that, am I? I, I or or is, is my data, like, so, like, if something has a name and an address and a phone number, that'll all be in one table? Yeah. So, you'll, you'll notice some patterns. Uh, it's just that not all of them will be immediately uh, obvious for human beings. Um, we also have a solution for that anyway, but I'll get to that at the end of my answer. So, yeah, I mean, basically it, the way it does uh, this splitting into documents is whenever you have keys that belong to the same level, like in this case, name, surname, and address, they'll go to the same table. Even though if they're in different parts of the document, different documents, they will all be in the same table. So that's, that's really good because even from if you want to go connect directly with the SQL to the underlying database and you want to perform a query there, you, you can do it and, and it will work. So you, you'll see all the data nicely ordered there, all the data that has the same, same size, the same structure, the same shape. Mm -hmm. Now, as long as all the tables are generated automatically, at some point, some of those, those tables may be a little bit weird if you're a human, uh, and as, as we are. So if you want to query with pure SQL, which is something that we really encourage users to do because it brings you a lot of power, um, well, we, it might be a little bit difficult. And I mean, at least, at least uh, uh, until you discover the way ToreDB is laying the tables on desk. However, we introduced recently a new feature which we call uh, Views. So it basically creates some SQL views and they are created automatically by ToreDB when you issue a command, which is called create view paths. And then when you issue this command, uh, ToreDB will create some views. And these views just, again, pull back together uh, the documents in a more nice way, which is more uh, easy for humans to, to analyze. Now, if, if you or the audience would like to uh, uh, 
get more information about how we really exactly minor details about how we do this, it's published on our wiki. So if you go to our GitHub page and then you click on the wiki, there's a link that explains bit by bit uh, how is this information, how this process works. Um, and so, uh, so these views, are, are, they, are they exposing JSON to me or is it just nicer column names and stuff? So the problem that these views are trying to solve is that uh, when, when the document varies in shape, like you, you insert one document with name, surname, you insert, you insert then another one with name, surname, and age, mm. those two documents will end up being on different tables on, on TorDB. These views, they pull this, all these tables back together, so always name, surname, age, and whatever else will be on a single, on a single table. This will not represent the whole document. A uh, whole document may also be split into several other pieces, but you, users usually process documents by path. So you say, I want to go for, I mean, I want to check the root document, or I want to say, hey, what is the address object, which is within uh, the address uh, key of the root level. And all those paths will be on the same table, on the same view, to be more precise. Okay, and these are read-only views, because it would be crazy for SQL to try to update these tables by hand, right? Yeah, yeah, it's that's discouraged uh, use. I mean, uh, there's nothing that uh, we can do to prevent that from happening. And if you really know what you're doing, you could do it, but it's definitely not a, uh, the uh, ideal uh, thing to do. It's uh, for read, for querying. So how, do you have people uh, with, that are doing joins against the NoSQL data, the ToroDB data, and their regular um, uh, relational data? Yeah. Indeed, that, that's a common use case because most applications evolve quickly over the time. And at some point, uh, we've seen people that uh, started using a relational database some time ago. Then they jumped into the NoSQL uh, trend because, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very requested by many developers. And so now they have an application which is a split between two separate, like, silos of information. And when, when they want to combine them all, it becomes very difficult because it's not that they are two different systems. It's even worse. They have different consistency rules and different consistency times. So maybe one is kind of an index or a cache. The other one is like the master information. If you try mm -hmm. to combine both, you may you may see like very uh, pro uh, a lot of problems, very difficult solutions because you know maybe the index is updated before the source of data or vice versa. I mean, consistency rules are different because their systems are different. And so when you're able to pull all of them back into the same system, they play by the same game, they play by the same rules, so you have consistent, a consistent view of your information. And that's, that's very helpful, we have found. Okay, and uh, you just mentioned indexes, and I, I, it made me think of the, is there a way in MongoDB using the wire protocol to say, I'm going to be doing a lot of queries against the age, can you make sure that's indexed, and do those actually pass through to Postgres? Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the wire protocol defines just send commands, but it's on the API. And the API, okay. you can create indexes on Mongo, so that's absolutely correct. Uh, and and we, uh, one index in Mongo may result in one or more indexes in TorDB. However, they are smaller, so in total size, they might be more or less the same size. And, and the good thing is that, again, this is all, uh, automatically done by TorDB. You don't have to do anything. Just use the MongoDB command to create an index, and the index will be created. The only difference that you may um, result with is that there's a, li a limit in MongoDB in the number of indexes you may have on a given collection. Uh, if I recall correctly, that's 16. And there's no such limit in TorDB. You can create as many indexes as you want. There's, there's no limit from a theoretical perspective. Awesome. And, and actually, that brings up another issue here. Um, uh, Postgres is obviously strongly typed, and document storage is... is weekly typed. I mean, I, I think you can tell whether it's a string or a number or maybe a date, but does, do those map through or do you just generate everything as text columns? Oh, no, no. We absolutely respect all the data types. Uh, that's why we might be uh, creating different tables for different data, which even looks like, I mean, has the same keys. They have different types. If we were converting everything to text, it would be, of course, definitely simpler, but then the queries will be very painful because you'll have to convert those back. So one of the main advantages of the way we distribute the information across many tables in, in, in Postgres, in, in any relational database for that matter, is that queries can become very efficient. Because we have kind of pre-classified the data. 
if if we we, we want we, we basically call this method like query by type. So basically, when we analyze the documents as, as soon as they come to us, uh, we analyze the documents and find a structure table matching that the structure of the document. So different documents with different properties, like the number of keys or the types of the keys, are in different tables. And this ends up being really good, because this is like kind of partitioning. Now, if you want to query for a document, you usually want to say, like, age is greater than 18. And at some point, age might be a text field, because people you know, type whatever, type TBD or, or 18 in, in letters or whatever. You, know, no, you, you cannot query those documents. And a database like, like any NoSQL database will scan all of those, regardless whether they are text, they are integers, or anything. And they have to parse all that all the time. And they have to interpret that whether that's a text field or an integer field. In TorDB, you'll have in a separate table those that are text, those that are integers or, or numeric. And, and so the query will be more efficient because it will be targeting only a smaller subset of the data where it's a numeric and you can, and you can compare that. So it's a good thing uh, that we are uh, respecting the original types of the information, so there's no text conversion. Wow, that is, that's, that's just totally cool. But uh, I know Aaron's wanting to ask some more questions, but I've got to pay the bills now for a moment. Because whether you're developing an app, a website, or working on a server-based project, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean offers droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed easily to host websites, web apps, production apps, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. This helps you get your project off the ground quickly and makes it easy to scale when you find success. DigitalOcean is used by over 600,000 developers, including me. I've been a happy customer of them since uh, scale last year, in fact, is where I found out about them. Uh, deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or simple API. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. That's mine. Thank you, FreeBSD. Select from one of the many pre-configured one-clicks like Drupal, Docker, or Node.js to get up and running quickly or build the exact infrastructure you need with root access to servers running 100% SSDs in state-of-the-art data centers around the world. It's highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. You can also use advanced features like floating IPs for high availability, private networking, and automated deployments via an API. Extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials and all the ways you can use your droplet. Want to configure a LAMP server, set up a virtual desktop or VPN, they've got you covered. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. There are also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit digitalocean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit, just like the name of the show. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code FLOSS in the billing section to get your $10 credit for free. We thank DigitalOcean for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly, and especially as long as it's been, too. It's been really great for them. And, uh, Aaron, I heard you got another question here. Yeah, absolutely. Alvaro, we've been talking a lot about data transformation, for lack of a better word, where you know, you're taking things in and you're kind of reorganizing them so that they'll fit nicely in Postgres, and then we're talking about taking files in. And as a database guy, especially as a relational database guy, whenever anyone tells me, oh, I'm going to be storing these files, or I'm going to be creating more indexes, or I'm going to be changing the data around, I always think, okay, what's the impact going to be on my file storage space? Because it sounds like there's a lot of extra stuff here that I'm going to have to store. So what's the impact of all this from a storage consumption standpoint? Well, there are like two, two different uh, facts that we can analyze here. The first one is uh, in terms of files or excessive table creation. There are some degraded cases in which it may happen that TorDB will create a large number of tables. Now, as long as we uh, did this previous work, uh, Billion Tables project, we have seen that this is not a very significant problem. Indeed, uh, we have performed benchmarks analysis on, on many collections of different data generated in, and used in different MongoDB databases. And it turns out the case, most of the cases, the number of tables generated is pretty small. Because at the end of the day, even though NoSQL advocacy says that you know you can you can be agile and you can change the shape of the document all the time you end up not doing that i mean if you change the shape of your documents all the time it would be very hard to query them afterwards right so at the end of the day if even if you look at a collection of millions of documents at the end of the day there are just a handful maybe 
up to a thousand uh, we have found of different uh, shapes, different types of documents. So even though TorDB in those cases will be creating at most thousands of tables, in case of Postgres, end up being thousands of files, it's, it's not a big burden. Current file systems will only pay stress when that reaches hundreds of thousands. So it's not a big deal, and this only happens in very special degraded cases. Normal case, we've seen millions of documents are on only three tables, sometimes even in one table. So it's, it's definitely not a big problem. Now, in terms of the storage, pure storage, uh, TorDB will give you relief because it turns out that it uses from 29% to 68% of the storage required by MongoDB to store the same information. So it's going to save you storage. It requires less storage. How is that possible? Well, because we are not repeating all this metadata that I was referring to before. So all this metadata, uh, like the name and the surname, as long as it's repeated a lot of times across the collection of documents, it takes a lot of disk space. We're factoring all that out and writing that meta information only once. So uh, it saves a lot of disk space. And this is even before compression. If you compress this afterwards, it's even better. But even before compression, you're already saving either saving a lot of disk space, or uh, you can you can purchase if you're on Amazon or, or Digital Ocean, right? You can you can get cheaper uh, SSDs or SSDs with more IOPS, with more speed at the same price point. So it's it's very convenient, I would say, from a from a uh, storage perspective. Well, this, that's a, you read my mind. I was just going to ask about compression and how, how it handles compression and, and performance. Uh, we do have a qu related question, though, uh, on this topic from Gray580 in the chat room. He says, I know it's JSON and all, but how does, it, how does uh, ToroDB handle binary data? So if we have something other than text, if we have a, if we have a, uh, a picture or uh, something like that that's, that's binary, how well does ToroDB handle that type of data? Well, that, that's for us just another data type. And, and Postgres handles uh, binary data types. There's, there's a type called byte A, and, and you can store any, any binary file there. So it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, just like you would store an integer, we will just store a, a byte A. Um, the only difference I would say is that in MongoDB, uh, binary fields are limited to uh, 16 megabytes, if I recall correctly. And, and you'll, uh, there's that, that's why you have to use like ReadFS or all the techniques that split this internally into several pieces. Uh, uh, TorDB does not need that, so you can store up to one gigabyte binary fields directly uh, without any other external help. Mm. Um, in terms of compression, we don't specifically use uh, compression per se in, in TorDB on Postgres. Uh, but Postgres itself does that already. Uh, for fields which are usually larger than 2Ks, 2 kilobytes, Postgres uses an internal mechanism called Toast, and this mechanism will compress data if, if that's worth uh, transparently, even for us. Now, if you run TorDB on Greenplum, uh, there's the possibility of using transparent compression that is performed at Greenplum, and it's a really good compression strategy because it's using columnar storage plus compression, and it works really, really well in, in terms of, of storage. So the other thing I wanted to follow up on was performance. You mentioned performance before, um, and we talked about that at the beginning. Of course, you're going to get a performance uh, benefit from Postgres because it's one of the fastest, if not the fastest, open source relational database servers out there. Um, but how much faster is it? Do you have any comparison or have you done any benchmarks between just straight MongoDB and ToroDB running on Postgres? Yeah, so um, the benchmarks are very easy to lie. And there's a lot of benchmarking game, which I would like not to get into. Uh, I usually don't do it. So it depends a lot on the workload. Uh, in terms of OLTP performance, when you're just trying to insert like a lot of tiny stuff, uh, like very fast, uh, we are uh, basically more or less at the same level as MongoDB, sometimes a little bit slower, sometimes a little bit faster. Uh, we have seen improvements from 0.93, I mean a little bit slower, to 1.5x, which means 50% faster. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this happens depending on the workload, the size of the data you're using, a lot of other factors. We are still development stage. We are trying to optimize the code a lot. There's a lot of code that we need to optimize yet. And we know we're going to be, be, I would say, significantly faster. Uh, 
but uh, they'll, they'll get more closely to the process where we approach GA. If you talk about more data analytics and, and data warehousing, uh, we've done some really impressive benchmarks. Uh, we've been working, in this case, again, with this uh, Greenplum database behind TorDB rather than Postgres. Postgres is also really good for OLAP and, OLAP and data warehousing, but Greenplum is probably more suited for that. And, and that we have seen up to 75 times better performance than MongoDB. And, and this was just some random queries that we were throwing at. This is not benchmarking. We were not trying to get the best results. I'm pretty sure there are some queries where performance is, is even better than that. So uh, 100 times more better. It's definitely perfect and, 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 and easy to be achieved in this case of scenarios. And we could even do better if we target, like, like you know, as, as I mentioned before, we're partitioning the data kind of by type. So we could craft some queries where we could be just targeting a tiny, tiny table in TorDB, which is a huge collection in MongoDB. And if you compare those queries, the performance will be, I don't know, whatever you want it, like 1,000x, 10,000x, it's really up to you. So that thing, that's, we're not going to do that. Um, we're working now, right now on running standard benchmarks. So we're running uh, IA Bench. Uh, we're also working on, on running YCSB. And we'll also be uh, running some more uh, or, uh, business oriented uh, benchmarks. Uh, we're working on that. And we'll be publishing all the scripts and all the code so that every user will be able to run and verify these benchmarks on their own. We don't want to do benchmarking. Well, that's, I'm glad to kind of hear you say that. I mean, I do a lot of benchmarks in my day job. Uh, I just have to do those because customers want to see how does this compare. But you're right. When you're comparing you know, different data types or maybe you're comparing different rewrite workloads or things like that, you can really – the numbers can skew all over the place. You have to be really clear when you're doing these what you're actually doing. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about cloud um, and how well this plays in the cloud uh, because – I know, in, you know, from dealing with Oracle in the past, you try to throw Oracle database. Uh, I don't even think Oracle Rack is supported on Amazon. The chat room can correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, you know, so how well does this actually scale when you start throwing it in the cloud? Can I run it on Amazon? Uh, can I use Amazon RDS, for example, or, or other cloud services? How well does it scale um, when it's not on-premise but actually in the cloud? Well, I, I would say that so far, all of the benchmarks that we have performed uh, have been performed on the cloud. So I can say that it's definitely cloud ready. There might be some specific versions or tunables that might be needed in the cloud. And we will document those when we uh, get GA. Um, and it should work uh, in RDS. But uh, we're working on, on some bits right now that might be needs to be fixed in order to make it completely uh, able to run on, on RDS per se. Um, we're also uh, making it, you know, um, working with uh, partnering with some cloud providers in order to make this experience uh, smoother. Now, it's, it's very convenient because you, the, the good thing about TorDB is that you can separate it into two pieces if you want. So it's TorDB itself and it's uh, the database. And those bo the, both can run on, on the same piece of hardware, which is uh, good for, for in terms of network round trips and latency. But at the same time, if you have already your, your database, be it on-premise or in the cloud, and you have like an app server running Java code already optimized and tuned and monitored, you can, you can place TorDB there. And, and so it will communicate with the database. Uh, so it, it's already optimized to avoid round trips. So it's, it's not a big deal if you run TorDB on a separate node than the database itself. Uh, it's not the most useful scenario, but you can play with it. And so it becomes very convenient, especially when you're deploying in, in cloud environments, because you, you can choose your, your architecture. That's awesome. That's great to hear, because I know a lot of companies are, um, it's a lot easier for them to go out to the cloud and just say, hey, I want to spin this thing up for three months. What about horizontal scaling? Are any plans to make it? sounds like this is a very uh, a vertical scaling model. Are there any plans to scale this horizontally as well? This is a, an area, a topic that I love to talk about. Um, so our current plans is to scale horizontally. I mean, we are a NoSQL database at the end of the day, right? So that's, that's what we want to provide, a better NoSQL database that is also a SQL database, a relational database. And so we have to scale horizontally. Now, uh, there are two ways for us to scale horizontally. The first one is to just, in, in this case, to uh, continue speaking the replication protocol of MongoDB and just add as many nodes as, as required and participate in that. 
Um, we already make a, a lot of progress in this area because we already speak the replication protocol, the Mongo replication protocol. It's just as of today, we can only be a secondary node. We cannot be a primary node. Uh, but that's going to be on the GA version. So we're working on this area, and, and it's, it's coming. Now you can set up TorDB as a secondary node. We'll replicate all the information from a MongoDB cluster. And, and once we have done that and, and done the sharding, you'll be able to scale horizontally a la Mongo, right? Now, there's a second way, which is very unique for us, because some databases, some backends that we can use can also shard below TorDB. So not Postgres itself, per se, uh, but some other databases uh, like uh, CytosDB, uh, like Greenplan that I mentioned many times today, they can shard your data uh, at the database level. So even if you use a single TorDB, and then all the data will flow through TorDB, and then will be sharded at the database level. So this is also horizontal scaling, but this is on a different layer. We're also uh, can, can right now researching and using Postgres Excel, which is a cluster-based multi-master multi version of Postgres that can also scale horizontally below us. And, and this is an area like, that is very interesting for us because like, uh, some, some software like this, like Postgres Excel, can offer you a complete consistent view of the database across all shards. If you look at MongoDB sharding, there's no consistent view. If you target single uh, shard, then that's consistent. But if you, if you target more than one at the same time, they're not strictly consistent from, from a consistent point of view in the distributed systems, like in CAP terminology, right? They're not completely consistent, whereas the systems like Postgres Excel, they are consistent. So we, can, uh, we are going to work in both ways at the same time, so as to provide different solutions to this horizontal scaling problem. Hey, uh, we actually had a question from the chat room. Uh, I think I know the answer, but I want to go ahead and let you answer it. Uh, uh, Gray 580 uh, again asked a real good question. It says, this is JSON. Does the DB engine compress the query results coming back to the server, like maybe gzip or something? But uh, I think I know the answer, but go ahead and, and tell me. What, what, what's actually happening? Is, this, is it all being pr presented in text as it goes across the wire? Well, uh Again, we, we speak MongoDB protocol, and, and so we uh, over the wire, what it gets sent is what MongoDB defined for their protocol. This protocol is a binary protocol, and all the documents, all the data, is sent as uh, uh, documents serialized in a binary format, which is called BSON. Not JSONB mm -hmm. as in Postgres, but BSON, which is binary representation of JSON. Uh, this format, it's not extremely efficient. It's kind of verbose, but it's what it is. Uh, but it's binary format. So that's what it's sent over the wire. And what about on the back end? Does Postgres use a kind of a binary format for that as well? Well, Postgres uses the binary, uh, the representation, internal representation of the data, which is binary for most data types except text. Um, text, if it gets very long, and by very mean uh, more than 2K, it's usually split into pieces and compressed internally, transparently. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, most of the data is going to be stored in a binary format very, very efficiently. As I mentioned before, comparing to MongoDB, we just require down from 28% to 69% of the same storage to store the same information. Okay, and um, um, one of the things I, I picked up on earlier is that you can use, uh, you can already use uh, um, uh, ToroDB as a slave. Does that mean I could migrate? from an existing MongoDB uh, platform installation just by making it a slave, letting it replicate all the data, and then turning off the other one? Yeah, and that's indeed one of the most interesting use cases. Uh, so uh, a lot of people is just using ToroDB to connect it to secondary. I mean, one use case is to replace, completely replace MongoDB by ToroDB. Uh, the other use case is just connect ToroDB uh, as a secondary node and start replicating data. This is less intrusive, of course. And then, you can, this, this node is going to be read-only, right? Because it's a secondary node, you cannot write to it. But once all the data has flown from uh, real-time, from MongoDB master to TorDB, and then it's split into tables, and then you have everything in beautifully relational tables, you can use SQL. SQL is a really powerful language. And a lot of people is coming back to SQL. Even the NoSQL guys are going back to SQL, which is kind of weird, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's what people know, and it's a very powerful language. So you can do an all your analysis, you can do it on, on TorDB on pure SQL. And this is not just a, a layer of compatibility of a SQL-like language, where, which is what more or less uh, most of the NoSQL products are doing. This is a SQL uh, language that looks like SQL. It's not just SQL. This is pure SQL. So in other words, like you can use TorDB 
as a, as a really good uh, BI connector using some terminology of some current products like MongoDB's BI connector, which is by the way proprietary. It's it's part of their their paid uh, enterprise version. It's not open sourced. Uh, uh, it tries to emulate SQL, whereas in TorDB this is native. So just just connect TorDB as a secondary node to your MongoDB OLTP cluster. Start replicating data real time, and then do your queries in SQL. That sounds awesome. Now, this thing is, is really amazing, and it's amazing as I remember it from scale. Your presentation a couple months ago. Um, uh, so uh, we'll, let's let's we could talk tech for another hour about this thing. I re I'm really fascinated by all yeah. the aspects of this. Um, but let's talk about the project a little bit now. So, what's the goal with the project? It's open source. Are you uh, is your company planning on like uh, adding a commercial version on top of this, or is it always going to stay open source? And you're going to provide uh, services and platforms, maybe. Yeah, we're fully committed to open source, and and we are not planning, and this is not going to happen, that we'll have an enterprise version. Uh, all the features, we want to have them open source. Um, so uh, our business model is more based on what you mentioned before, services and, and support for TorDB. We, we believe this is the way to go. This is a very uh, well and proven business model. And, and you know, when you end up make, making things uh, proprietary with your enterprise version, uh, it suddenly creates competition with your own products and in our opinion it turns out not to be a uh, really good thing plus you're using a lot of you're, you're losing a lot of feedback from your users uh, so we we have grown a lot based on what users and and people have talked to us about TorDB and we don't want to lose that so this is not going to happen uh, we're also we're always going to be open source and when is TorDB going to be a uh, prime time ready well, um, I can say <laughs> 2016. Okay. Christmas, maybe. Uh, Christmas. <laughs> hopefully cool. before cool. that. Hopefully before and, uh, that. And have, uh, have, have, yeah, have you had contributions from anybody outside the company yet? Yes, yes. We have, we have had contributions. Uh, we're expecting even more contributions. So if you're listening to this, if you're watching this video, I would really encourage you to go to GitHub and 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 uh, send us a pull request or just feedback or create issues. Just let us know if you like this project. Project if you like just the code, you're a developer. Just start it on GitHub. Uh, that will also help us. But you know, yeah, we really appreciate contributions. We're also working now with partner companies, working in different areas to also uh, have contributions back to TorDB. Great. And what license is this under? Oh, so TorDB is under a GPL version three, a Ferro GPL version three. Okay, very cool. You know, uh, we're almost out of time, but is there anything I didn't ask, or that either of us didn't ask, that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we let you go? Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm really happy to ask people just to give it a try. I mean, this is open source, won't hurt you, you don't have to pay for it, and we really, really appreciate feedback. So what I would ask people to do is just go on and try it and report us anything, any feature that is not done yet, please let us know. We are very open, uh, so we are welcoming, uh, welcoming and waiting for uh, any contribution, even if it's just feedback or usage or use cases or whatever. Awesome, awesome. And my final two questions are, what's your favorite text editor? Oh, it's BI, no question. Ah, oh, it's not another email. Another guy's not Emacs again. I hate that. Anyway, and what's your yeah, favorite programming great. language? Ah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Peter. <laughs> okay, and then what's your what's your favorite uh, programming language? Uh, Java. Okay, what about scripting language? Java is not really a scripting language. Um, Java. Okay. I, mean... <laughs> <laughs> I claim that anyway. All right. <laughs> I, just, I never think of Java as a scripting language, but that's okay. No, Great. I would say shell. You know, but no, I basically uh, believe Java is extremely productive language and has a, the largest uh, software ecosystem in the world. So uh, even if you want to script something, I would say just just go Java. Or if you really want kind of, kind of a scripting groovy. Uh, that's kind of an option, too. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, Alvaro, it's been really wonderful. Uh, oh, Alvaro, sorry. Uh, it's been really wonderful having you on the show. I'm just as excited about this as I was before. Please hurry up and finish it so I can talk about to my clients because I'm sure okay. it'll actually solve problems around here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't risk, uh, you know, professional company data on something that's still a little early. So uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd, I'd plug it in right t right today. But uh, I'm, I maybe, I'm waiting maybe, yeah, for you to jump on it. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, great, great. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on the show and talking about uh, TorDB. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's been really a pleasure.
Very cool, very cool. That was Alvaro uh, Hernandez speaking to us from Spain, woohoo, about, uh, uh, which actually I, I know from looking at the FAQ, that's why the name is Toro, because that's a very important thing. It's a, you know, it's a represents the symbol of Spain and stuff, but we, I didn't ask him that because I already knew the answer. All right, hey, uh, Aaron, what do you think? This is really cool. I mean, um, it really is like a Reese's peanut butter cup, right? I mean, you're, it's the best of both worlds, or at least it sounds that way. The fact that you can do SQL queries over uh, the NoSQL data, as well as the relation, relational data. And we didn't, really, didn't get a, a whole lot of chance to talk about this, but we mentioned analytics a lot. And uh, a, a big problem in analytics is having, you've got separate data sources all over the place and trying to get all that into do a MapReduce or something on it, it can be really, really challenging. Um, and at least for, for a portion of that workload, if you had it all together and you could run your queries and say, oh, I want to know when this person came into the store, but I also want to know what their purchase history is, um, then you can start to combine those two, two things together and you could write an app that says, hey, I noticed last time you were here, you bought toilet paper. Would you like to go buy some more toilet paper? It's on aisle five. Um, those types of things, it uh, sounds like, are made a lot a lot easier when um, you're using something like this. So I think it has a huge potential. And also, I think uh, for the scientific community, this would have huge potential. So people like uh, CERN, for example, or any of the national laboratories, around the U.S., anybody like that um, that's doing these types of things wants to take advantage. They want to have as much speed as possible. They want to reference the information in whatever way their scientists are happy to reference it. And so I think this would be huge for the scientific community as well. So I'm I'm two thumbs up on this one. I think it's great. I know the, the – uh, uh, the content is a little dry for folks that aren't into databases, and uh, but if you're a developer, you, you pretty much have to store your data somewhere, and it almost always goes into either a NoSQL database or a relational database. So uh, this is hugely important for uh, developers and the work that they do. Yeah, and one of the things I've seen as well, and I'm really appreciate about this particular project, is I've seen people do, uh, I forget what they call them, the way they, they, they to create a schemaless data storage. They create object ID, key, value as three columns. And that's such a mess to try to, you know, gather up stuff and, and move stuff around. This is actually making real tables that are optimized for queries that were everything in this column is an int, everything in this column is a text. Yeah. I, I think it's that's that's the brilliance of this. I haven't seen anybody ever do it this way before because that's part of why JSON data was added to all the modern databases, uh, all the modern relational databases, because it solves that weird side problem where you do have some, uh, you know, schema-less or schema, you know, semi-schema, I'll just yeah. the word, semi-schema data where most of the things look the same, but you have to have a few of them have extra columns or something like that. And this this solves it in a brilliant way. This is truly a, a remarkable work, which is why when I saw it at scale, I said, I got to get these guys on the show. So uh, I think now and you can see why, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Well, we're running out of time, so let me go ahead and wrap up our, our uh, who's coming up soon. We have uh, next week, speaking of NoSQL databases, we've got CouchDB 2.0. We had uh, Jan Leonard on back in 2008, but he's done a lot of work with it since. And uh, I hope he's pronouncing his name right. Uh, that's basically a JavaScript accessible database. So you stick you stick JSON data in there and pull the JSON data back out, and uh, and you can do it directly from the web uh, web browser. That's what I was thinking, actually, what I was asking uh, uh, Alvaro earlier. Um, and he's actually on for two weeks in a row. It's going to be Jan Linhart, uh two-for-one show, two, two shows. He's also got a new project out called Hoodie, which is an easy back-end for front-end devs. So, you know, you've got to have a, you got to have some database running somewhere, and you want it to be simple for front-end devs and that don't always know all the ins and outs of back-end stuff. So this is just sort of like a drop-in database that you can use with your front-end projects. Uh, following that, we have David Wilson and Heather Wilson, who are going to talk to us about Linux certification with Linux Camp 2016 coming up. They're going to talk to us about what that all is. Uh, some of you want to be certified. Uh, I'm certified in... Nothing. <laughs> Certified crazy, but that doesn't count. All right. And uh, just added to the schedule, we have the Mozilla's executive director, Mark Sermon. Oh, that's not right. That's not him. Uh, maybe I pulled it up wrong. Uh, we have somebody coming on soon. Um, uh, I think it's no, – now, now they're going to – Mozilla, the guy's going to yell at me. Uh, but anyway, they're going to talk about the, the project internally in Mozilla to make uh, encryption – better, stronger, faster. With all this talk now about things uh, leaking everywhere and stuff, Mozilla's going to take a very strong stand on that. Also just added to the schedule slightly before OSCON, we tend to do a traditional uh, OSCON preview. So we're going to have a couple of executive directors uh, from the OSCON group. Uh, that's the open source convention. This year, of course, moved away from my home city, sorry. It's down in Austin, Texas, in what's hopefully not going to be the warm part of the year. Anyway, they're going to come on. We're still filling the, the schedule. Twitter.tv slash floss is the homepage for the show. From there, you'll find a link to our upcoming 
upcoming guests. Uh, again, if you have somebody not on that list, please have the project leader or community coordinator email me. That's how most of those get on, except today's guest, because I found him myself. Um, we're still in Q2 as we're doing that. We have live stream. We took questions from there today. Uh, it's uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. Uh, uh, live at twit.tv. There's also a video you can watch us make all the mistakes behind the scenes. Uh, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus. You can follow, uh, which then retweets to Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Merlin on Twitter, M E R L Y N. But more importantly, all my material is sourced on Google Plus. There's Randall L. Schwartz. Again, I'm going to be at Oscon, probably covering it for the show, finding new guests, things like that. Uh, I'm also going to be at Yapsy North America, which is going to be in Orlando this year in the middle of the summer. What were they thinking? All right. Anyway, <laughs> it should be fine. Uh, anything you want to plug, Aaron? Uh, yeah, you can also follow me on Google Plus, of course. Uh, that's where I source all my material as well. It's a great place. I, I hope uh, more people start using it. Um, I've recently got back into <clears throat> Facebook a little bit to uh, to deal with some other things, not personal related, but to to respond to some questions and things that were coming up. And uh, boy, it's ugly. It's a mess. I, I, I hate Facebook. It's awful uh, in terms of visual appeal. Yes. Anyway, oh, anyway, okay, off that. Uh, you can also, if you're in the uh, uh, Northern California area, we're doing a mini Maker Fair up here in my hometown of Benicia. And if you want to get involved, you can go to BeniciaMakerFair.com. Uh, we're still taking late entries for exhibitors. And uh, more importantly, it's on April 16th. Uh, we go the whole day, and it's a lot of fun. So you should definitely come out, get your tickets online. You can you can get discounted tickets right now in advance, and uh, it's just a it's just a lot of fun. So I encourage anyone if you're anywhere around Benicia, it's not just for this town; it's for the whole region. Uh, go out, buy a ticket, or or apply to exhibit your cool stuff. We'd love to have you. Very cool. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Aaron, again for co-hosting today's show. I always appreciate it when you get a chance to do that. So uh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I love to do this show. It's always interesting. Very cool, very cool. And we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.